Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Food, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Amir Sayad Abdi, the host of the channel. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Jeff Miller about his new book, Avocado, A Global History, which was published in 2020 by Reaction Books. Jeff is an associate professor of hospitality management at Colorado State University. Jeff, thanks for accepting my invitation and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, to start off, Jeff, um, uh, could you tell us a bit about your background, about yourself and also about your research? Uh, my background first, I guess. Uh, I started out actually as a chef for 20 years. And so I worked in uh, small white tablecloth restaurants and boutique hotels. I went to culinary school. And so I did that for the for I call my first career. And then I went to graduate school and uh, became a teacher. And I teach in a hospitality management program, but my interests have always been in the nexus of food and culture and, and what, uh, what we eat and what it says about us and our food practices and things like that. And so I've been involved with the Association for the Study of Food and Society and, and done a number of research projects in the area of food and culture. And then I had the opportunity to write this uh, single topic book on avocados for reaction books. And avocados is such a popular topic today that the, the book's been uh, that the, the book's been fairly well received. And it's uh, I, I learned so much about avocados writing it that it was it was quite the educational experience for me as well. Um, so um, your book, uh, as I said, is about avocado and uh, it is part of uh, reaction books edible series. And for those listeners who don't know about uh, edible series. It's a series that focuses on the global history and uh, culture of one type of food or beverage in uh, each of its book. And your book, Jeff, is on avocado. But why avocado? Um, you know, could you elaborate a, a bit more on that? Well, uh, the genesis of it was kind of circuitous, and, and I'm not sure we need to get into that here. But avocado is really kind of the symbolic food of the first part of the 21st century, I think. If, if you had to think of a food that was iconic for this early part of the century and, and the young generation that's eating and the, the fact that food is so global now, and this is a, a food item that came out of a very limited area of Mexico and had a very limited distribution uh, for a long time, and then now is kind of the the poster child for modern and hip eating. You'd, you'd have to pick the avocado. And uh, could you give us a very kind of light version of the historical background of uh, of uh, avocado as you discuss in your book? I mean, uh, where does it come from? How long has it been in, in existence? Uh, how long has it been used as uh, an ingredient? And uh, since you're based in the U.S., and so are many of our listeners. Uh, how did avocado find its way to the U.S.? Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. Avocados are actually a fairly old food. Um, they are from the central highlands of Mexico. So um, where listeners might be familiar with is uh, the area around Guadalajara, uh, the town of Tequila, which a lot of people have heard of. And so the, the southwestern part of Mexico, southwest of Mexico City, the there's pine forests in these temperate highlands, and this is where the avocado originated. Um, it's got an, it's, it's interesting, it, it, it originated in a very small area, but it was a favorite food of what we call the mega herbivores. So uh, things like gomphiers and toxodons and giant ground sloths and some of these animals that are no longer with us, but it was a good food for them. And they would eat this because it was a dense calorie source and it was a source of vegetable fats. And they had such big digestive tracts that they could excrete it. And as they went along, they spread the range of it. And so eventually it, it ranged from central Mexico down into what is now Guatemala and that area. Uh, these animals went extinct, but uh, the avocado was, was, the avocado was um, resilient and was able to hang on until humans came and humans recognized the deliciousness and the value of it and started spreading it. And so it went further south down in, into what's now Northern South America. The, uh, the Incas adopted it and grew it in Peru and it grew around the coast of Northern uh, 
South America and into the Caribbean islands. And so it got fairly widespread and was used by many of the indigenous peoples for a lot of the same reasons that we eat it. It's, it's delicious. Uh, it's a good source of calories. Um, there it, it grows naturally quite well. And so it's an abundant natural food source. Uh, and then uh, when the uh, Spanish conquerors came to that area, they adopted it right away. They called it poor man's butter, and they used it almost as a, as a butter substitute in a lot of ways. And then uh, it actually went to Europe, and then it came back to the, to the United States. Um, but it really uh, served a lot of purposes for a lot of people. How it got on its current path was that it was being grown and consumed a lot in uh, the markets of central Mexico and Mexico City. And uh, people were looking for new foods to grow in California. California in its early days was not the land of Hollywood and uh, Silicon Valley and the hippies and beatniks in San Francisco. It was the fruit and vegetable basket of the United States. And uh, people were looking for new and unusual products to grow in Southern California and avocados did extremely well there. Um, and they started breaching the consciousness of American chefs and got started there. But they remained somewhat of a niche product for a long time. Uh, they were, they've always been expensive, uh, even more so in the early days than they are today. Um, so they were considered an upscale uh, food product. And a lot of the early recipes were combined with things like grapefruit and shrimp and other asparagus and other expensive ingredients. So it's very much a status food. It really wasn't until uh, Southwestern food, Mexican food, Tex-Mex food became widely popular in the United States that it really grew to what it's considered today. It's kind of modern uh, popularity levels. And Really, we can almost single-handedly ascribe that to the dish of guacamole. Uh, as Americans wanted more exotic things to eat uh, while they watched football and, and other things like that, uh, American viewers know that uh, the Super Bowl, the, the National Football League Super Bowl, is the most popular food occasion in the United States after Thanksgiving. And we eat tons of, of guacamole during that. And... Uh, from there, it just took off and everybody had to have an avocado. And then with the boom in avocado toast of the late 1990s and the early 21st century, that just sealed avocado's place in, in the cultural pantheon of, of modern, you know, interesting, cool, uh, exotic gourmet foods. Um, that was uh, indeed uh, an interesting history. Uh, but uh, you mentioned something uh, that I want to um, kind of follow up on. Um, avocado has become one of those fruits that is like available all year round, right? And right. Uh, it has also become uh, associated with the uh, uh, middle class and white middle class at that, which you mentioned. And uh, whenever, you know, these happen, whenever a, a particular food item turns into uh, sort of a commodity, uh, for the global north, uh, it is um, kind of safe to assume that somewhere else in the world, uh, most likely somewhere in the global south, is dealing with the consequences of uh, such mass productions or uh, monoculture plantations and everything that comes with uh, globalized agriculture, basically, uh, both in terms of you know environmental consequences for those regions and also um, you know issues of regional livelihoods. Um, so what are some of these, um, you know, in case of avocado? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of consequences to avocado production and distribution uh, because it's become so popular. Uh, the, the, the price of an avocado today is uh, still ex extremely high as, as a percentage of annual income in for middle class white people in North America, it's smaller than it's ever been, but it's still an expensive item. And so that price that it brings in the United States and in other places in the global north, uh, Great Britain has 
really seen a huge increase in the amount of avocado that it eats and, and other places like that. It's become a status food in China now. Um, so all these large markets that have capital to buy it have driven the price up. As a result, a lot of uh, avocado production uh, in Mexico, Mexico is still the largest producer of, of avocados, but a lot of that production gets funneled to, you know, the United States, especially, but also to Great Britain to some degree, and, and certainly to China. As a result, uh, it's a food that used to be uh, inexpensive, you know, nutritious. Uh, uh, an avocado is calorie dense. It provides a lot of valuable dietary fats uh, for people who may not have access to meat for protein and for, it's a high protein fruit. It's a fruit, actually. It's a high protein fruit, which is unusual. So it provided lots of nutritional benefits to indigenous people and, and you know, people who are traditionally poor and smallholders and things. But because it's, it's so profitable in the export trade that it's become unavailable to a lot of people who at one time used it as a valuable nutritional asset. I hear that in the markets in uh, central Mexico today, uh, the, the prices have doubled and tripled in recent years and and it used to be something that was virtually free now can take you know two to three hours of an average working person's wage or even four hours to buy an avocado or two so it's very much changed the economics of uh, who has it available to them in Mexico uh, you know if you don't have a tree in your own yard a lot of times that you can't you can't even afford one so that's become a problem uh, Avocados can be grown in so many places, um, but for the most part, uh, a lot of them, they, they could be a good solution in some places for some people. But once again, it's a it's it's an economic issue where where governments are very desperate for foreign exchange and they see an avocado as green gold, so to speak. And so they export a lot of it. Um, but it's also had some negative effects uh, in places where it's grown ecologically, uh, in the global south especially. Um, it's, it's, uh, avocados are very thirsty. And uh, an avocado, just as, as kind of a general rule of thumb, a large avocado takes about a bathtub full of water to, to get to maturity, which makes it a fairly thirsty piece of fruit. When it's grown in places that don't have a lot of water, like Australia or Chile, a lot of water gets diverted to the production because uh, governments want to uh, make sure that it's an export crop that brings a lot of money to the local economy. Um, it's problematic in Australia. We'll see how long they're able to grow uh, avocados due to their water shortages and how hot it's getting in lots of parts of Australia these days. Chile's a particularly terrible case. Chile does a lot of growing of food for export as a way to boost its economy. The government really promotes that. And we see it everything from salmon farms to uh, all kinds of fruit that's grown in, you know, we call winter fruit in the United States. So things that are grown in the Southern hemisphere and shipped up here to give us fruit in the winter. And avocado is, is getting grown more and more in Chile. And Chile is a, a very much a water starved country. And there aren't good regulations about who gets the water and how it's distributed fairly. And places that used to have fairly diverse agriculture and had uh, fairly good provisions for smallholders to make a living and grow diverse, diversified farms and things are being water starved uh, as water gets diverted to these avocado plantations. And as a result, uh, they have what they call ghost valleys that used to be fairly well populated, full of smallholders and people, you know, who are doing, you know, I wouldn't exactly say substance agriculture, but we're smallholders making small livings and they're being pushed out because the, the big growers are being able to basically steal all the water or certainly take much more than they're allocated. And there's really not a solid legal mechanism in Chile for them to assert their water rights. So we, we see some definite problems with it. Um, in terms of legalistic propositions and and smallholders and people who could use this, um, there are some places where it's it's done a little better, but overall it it's kind of a problem like that. And and there are of course crime problems associated with it in Mexico as well. 
Yeah, you, you, you actually discuss some cartel involvement in avocado production in Mexico, right? Yes, uh, because, you know, in, in Mexico, it's one of the biggest, and certainly in central Mexico, it's one of the biggest industries. And um, there, cartels, unfortunately, have an outsized influence in, in northern and, and south central Mexico. Um, and every so often, uh, the government decides they're going to crack down on the cartels and they, they run various, you know, campaigns against cartel influences and cartel criminal activities. And so one thing that the, the cartels have done have kind of muscled their way into the avocado business. And as a result, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of cartel control of certain orchards, certain distribution systems, certain production factories for packing and shipping and making guacamole. Um, if you did kind of a, a dollar averaging kind of scheme, you know, the, the cartels, if you think about every dollar of avocado that's imported into the United States, uh, you know, the, the cartels get five or 10 cents of that, and it makes them extremely wealthy, extremely powerful. They uh, use physical force to force people to join them. They control a lot of distribution access. So uh, it's there's definitely a lot of cartel involvement in it uh, to the detriment of the smallholders and to the to the ordinary people that work in the industry, which is a lot in South Central Mexico. Uh, I was reading just the other day about a chef in London who has stopped serving avocados altogether. And when they interviewed him about it, he said that the, the avocado is the blood diamond of central Mexico, and he doesn't want his restaurant to be associated with that anymore. And we're seeing more awareness of that and, and some people starting to not serve avocado in commercial food service. But that's extremely hard because uh, customers, at least in, in the global north, very much want avocado. It's it's, you know, it's a modern food, it's a glamorous food, and uh, a lot of people think that they need it, you know, in their operations to draw customers and make a living. So, but, but there, there are people becoming more aware of, of the pernicious influence of the, the cartels in, 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 the, in the global avocado trade. Um, that, that was a really good point, Jeff. And um, do you think, I mean, uh... I know this is a very general question and it's not within the scope of this podcast, perhaps. Uh, but is there anything that we could do to, you know, make situation better for uh, avocado pr producers apart from stop eating avocado? Yeah, that's 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 actually a question that I wrestle with quite a bit personally. Um, uh, you know, I, I got very familiar with the situation with avocados and I ate a lot of avocados while I was doing some research for this book. Um, one of the things that's happening <clears throat> is that avocado production is becoming more globalized. And so there are opportunities for me personally. I try, I, I live in a part of the United States where uh, avocados from Mexico are the primary uh, way to get avocados, but there, there is seasonal production of avocados that the United States actually has a pretty big avocado industry itself. So, you know, as an individual, I'm trying to limit my avocado uh, consumption to avocados that are grown in the United States. I, I can't say I'm perfect at it, but I really try and focus mine there. And a lot of the cartel avocado uh, production is Hass avocado. So Hass in the United States is by far the largest kind of avocado. So it's the smaller avocado. The skin gets really dark purple blackish when it gets ripe it's very popular with consumers it's got the you know this is just what american consumers have been trained as avocados but other people around the world know there's lots of other kinds of avocados and there's green skin avocados and uh there's a, a large industry in florida of green skin avocados and we see those sometimes um and certainly if you are you know in in the global south if you know new zealand has a as a prosperous avocado industry. Uh, Australia does as well. South Africa's growing some avocados, although their water problems are getting such, who knows about that. Um, there's some there's some production coming out of Central Africa that's, that's pretty safe. So some consumers around the world have some, some non-cartel choices. Others of us, I think, 
are not going to be able to eat avocado on a daily basis if we want to feel good about it. And I, I advocate frequently with people that we should think maybe more about avocado as, as a delicacy as opposed to an everyday thing that we eat. And we, you know, we can cherish it more and we can think about, well, when American avocados are in the stores, we can get them from California, we can get them from Florida, we should, we should eat, eat them. And then like things that, you know, so many things that used to be seasonal are now year round. Maybe it's time to think about some foods that are only seasonal again. You know, in, in America, we we only eat pumpkin pie, you know, at Thanksgiving and, you know, Christmas, and we only eat cranberries at the winter holidays here as well. So maybe it's time to think about avocado as a, as a seasonal treat like that as well. Thank you, Jeff. And um, you, you mentioned that uh, Mexico is right now the largest producer of avocado, but who's the largest consumer or consumers of avocado today? Oh, without question, the United States is, well, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of indigenous consumption in Mexico. Um, it's a place where a, a, a lot of smallholders have a personal tree, like in their yard or in one of their fields, and so they can feed their families on it. And Americans only want Hass avocados. And so any kind of green skin or, or, or other kind of other uh, uh, species or variety of avocado um, uh, tends to be cheaper in the markets. And so there's a lot of still a lot of consumption, although it, it's it's going down, consumption's going down in Mexico due to the price of the Hass and the export. But other than that, absolutely, the United States, uh, we consume billions and billions of avocados every year. The, the amount of avocados that we consume uh, for the Super Bowl and for Cinco de Mayo, which is a popular holiday for North Americans to celebrate, it's a, it's a phenomenal amount. So we, we're, we're number one. I would say in Europe, uh, Britain is probably number one. I don't have statistics at hand about uh, Australia and New Zealand, but I know it's a, it's a pretty high consumption level there as well. It is, indeed. <laughs> and uh, at, the end of, at, at the end of the book, uh, you also include some recipes with avocado, Jeff. Uh, where do these recipes come from? I mean, what did you choose those recipes in particular? Is there a kind of a story behind them? Well, of course, you have to, you know, you have to put in a guacamole recipe that I, I think that's probably the number one use for avocado <laughs> in the world today. Yeah. And certainly it's it's the most popular application in America. And we went through a phase in the United States where we ate a lot of avocado toast, but uh, possibly that's not as big as it used to be. But we we put avocado on sandwiches and we eat a lot of guacamole. So that had to be it. But I also wanted to include some things that were uh more international in nature uh in in a lot of places uh outside the the, the more developed countries uh, avocado is used as a beverage a lot and so i put in a recipe from indonesia that is like a coffee avocado shake that's a very big drink there um uh one of the things that if you get into uh more uh traditional uh mexican food uh, it's it's used as a thin salsa a crema a lot. So I put in a recipe for that. And then I put in some some of the what I considered the old American classics. Um, uh, one of the things that was very popular for decades in the United States was a grapefruit and avocado salad uh, that I thought I had to include. And then a couple of them were just favorites of mine. I I, I love absolutely love a shrimp louis which is possibly one of the most decadent dishes on the planet you you take oh, a I half of you take a half of avocado and you fill it with shrimp which is bound with a with a very decadent rich cream sauce and you eat the whole thing and it's you know it's, you know you, you certainly don't don't eat it on a diet but it's fabulous and decadent and delicious and one of my all-time favorites and i thought well I'm just going to put that in there because it's one of the things that I love to eat. And, and it's, we don't see it as much as we used to. And I think, you know, if you're going to make your avocado splurge, why not go all the way? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so you have tried all of the recipes or just some of them uh, that, that isn't included in the book? Oh, no, I've, I've tried them all. They're all, they're, they're, they're all, they're all good to my taste. I, I haven't had any feedback that they're not good. And, and some of them I'd really encourage uh, listeners to try, uh, even, you know, even if they don't buy my book, everybody should buy my book, of course. But if you <laughs> even don't, uh, these the inter 
recipes, these things are widely available on the internet. And, and a lot of these uh, beverages that are made with uh, avocado are, are really delicious. You know, you have an avocado uh, chocolate shake or avocado coffee shake. That's a, they're really great ways to start the day. Yes, no, definitely. Uh, so they are all tried and tested by an avocado expert. I don't know what else. <laughs> uh, and um, there's obviously a lot more in the book, and I encourage listeners to pick up a copy. But uh, before we wrap up the interview, uh, I'd like to ask you, Jeff, whether you're working on something right now, or are you thinking about doing your research on a particular topic in a near, near future? Uh, well, I, right now I am working. I have a, a book that I'm hoping comes out pretty soon. It's actually an edited book, uh, of which I'm the editor for and I've written a couple of chapters for, but it's on the topic of superfoods. And that's something that I've kind of gotten interested in, in lately. Um, uh, you know, we, superfoods are really big right now. And, and just to kind of give you a quick thumbnail, superfoods are things that we, think have, you know, a particularly, you know, a therapeutic or nutritious, highly nutritious or super therapeutic kind of property, you know, very condensed in one food. And so things like a sigh or avocado, some people think, or, uh, you know, blueberries or any number of things, right? We give them the superfood label uh, and people, you know, consume them in great quantities. Um, and so I've got an edited book coming out about that. And that really kind of tweaked my interest because, um, once again, there's some of these issues about indigenous peoples and the global south and, and, and some of these foods being diverted from their uh, original populations of consumption to feed rich people in the north. But also, uh, I think they have almost a mystical appeal to them. A lot of them, people think they want a magic bullet to cure a disease or they want something that will make them feel more youthful or something that will extend their longevity. And as I read some of these rationales for people eating them, it really made me think, well, you know, humans for some reason are uh, interested in being immortal, I think. You know, this is quest for almost immortality. And, and we have culturally so many examples of, of people who, you know, in, in, in myth and legend and, you know, with, uh, the people who have come up with the food, you know, Gilgamesh has the food that, that gives him immortality. And, uh, you know, Soma in India supposedly gives you immortality. And I think we search for these foods that give us youthful vitality and, and vicariously, in a sense, you know, satisfy our quest for immortality. And, and so that kind of got me interested in the whole topic. And so now, uh, hopefully in, in 2022, this book will be out that gives people a look at them. And, and I think the book is interesting because it talks about the cultural history of the food and, and the indigenous peoples and, and where it's from. And then it goes into a, a very, was, these chapters are written by scientists. So there's a very uh, clinical overview of the nutritional properties and what's true about the foods and what's bunk, you know, what's over promoted and what's not true. And then ends with a, with a couple of recipes. And there's also a piece in there about some of these, like the avocado have, uh, you know, some serious uh, ecological problems with production and overproduction and inappropriate production. So it's an exciting topic. And then I'm going to work on, on some work on some other things as well. I got always got my fingers in a lot of pies. That's uh, I'm very interested in the taxonomy of beverages. And so I'm working at something there and then totally off the food thing is uh, I'm thinking about writing a, a short history of the concept of being busy. Oh, okay. I, I can't, I mean, <laughs> I, I gotta ask, what is that about exactly? Well, you know, I, I, uh, this is, this is kind of one of these social reactions that, uh, just kind of have fascinated me in the last five years or so when you run into somebody you haven't seen for a while, or you are talking to maybe a work colleague, uh, and you say, you know, it's just a simple greeting in a hallway, or you run into them somewhere at a grocery store, and you say, hey, so-and-so, it's so good to see you. How have you been? And the ubiquitous answer to this question is, oh, I'm just so busy. And I'm like, that, that strikes me that if everybody is 
universally giving me this answer that, oh, I'm so busy. It's like, well, well, why, why are you so busy? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't interrogate them on the spot, but I'm on, in my mind, I think, well, why is everybody all of a sudden so busy? What are they doing? Um, you know, is it, is it negatively impacting their life to the point where they're complaining about it? Or are they bragging that they're, that, you know, they're, they're so important and they're so at the center of everything that, 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 that busy is, is almost like a status badge. And so I just kind of want to do some writing that kind of interrogates this concept of, you know, why, why, why has being busy and exhausted and frazzled become, you know, kind of the, 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 the constant state in our society and what makes it so attractive to be, I mean, if it's, if it was so horrible and so awful, I think more people would get off the treadmill, but apparently it's not horrible and awful. That sounds like a very interesting project, Jeff, and I can't wait to uh, read it whenever yeah. it comes out. Um, so you're very busy writing this all project. Um, so uh, any further comments? Anything you, you want to add, Jeff, before we say goodbye? Uh, well, I just uh, hope everybody enjoys avocados and enjoys them responsibly. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting topic. It's, uh, I hope even if you don't get my book that you read a little more history of avocado. It's, uh, it's, it's, just such a, it's just a dish that is so, it has come out of nowhere and placed itself kind of at the pinnacle of our social food imagination that it's it's just a fascinating topic so i hope people get as much enjoyment out of learning about it as i did and as i did too um thank you so much for uh coming on the show and speaking with me today jeff and sharing your insight and your work with our listeners it was an absolute pleasure talking to you well thank you so much for having me i Have appreciate you thank you very much bye, -bye. Uh, goodbye